Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 29th of October 2024. Let's start where we normally start, Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply and you can find them in the description to the video below. Okay, uh, some interesting numbers here with the stats and a few categories going kind of a bit up and down. 1,360 personnel lost is still an exceptionally high number over 1,300, yet uh, a, a tad down from where we have seen it, goodness, 1,680, I think it was yesterday. So that's 320 down from there. It's, it's a huge drop, and yet it's still incredibly high. Nine tanks is contextually, I think, high. That's pretty much on the daily average, but I think that's a pretty good amount of tanks for the Russians to have lost. Nine armoured personnel vehicles is about half the daily average, so that is, there's a significant drop there. However, we do have 89 vehicles and fuel tanks, which is another day of incredible, incredibly high numbers. We've got record uh, seven day and 30 day rolling averages in that category. In fact, I wondered that, that I'm pretty sure that's still going to be the case today. So where you see a drop in infantry fighting vehicle AFVs and whatnot, I wonder whether you're replacing them with other vehicles. Um, so if we look at, make sure we've got the 29th, yep. So this is, we have 89 there, 100, 100, 95, 79, 69, 106, 877. So that's pretty, uh, I'm pretty sure that is going to be, um, a, yeah, so we have record seven day and 30 day averages for, rolling averages for vehicles and fuel tanks. Uh, 91.14 is a rolling seven day average in that category. So really high numbers again there. Uh, so where we see a drop in a APVs, it could well be that they are using other vehicles to do those attacks. Instead, we I've we certainly seen quite a few bits of motorcycle footage, um, which is not unusual, very common these days. 10 pieces of special equipment. We have 45 artillery systems. To throw in there, that's a pretty high number in that category, well over double the daily average, and one multiple launch rocket system. Right, we have two days of Andrew Perpetual loss lists, uh, though not yesterday's one. So these are actually referred to uh, uh, effectively three days ago and two days ago. Okay, so what we have for, I presume the first one, it doesn't really matter either way, uh, we have the Russians losing a good, probably three times the, uh, the numbers of, the, the pieces of equipment that the Ukrainians are lost in terms of combat asset losses. So going from the top of the turquoise to the bottom of the orange, we have about a two to one probably loss ratio. The Russians just losing a lot more civilian vehicles and trucks there. And that's how it goes from a sort of two to one to a three to one overall loss ratio. Let's look at the Ukrainian um, loss stats. We have Surveillance and comms equipment, a Plaston RP3000. Let's have a look at that. Plaston uh, RP3. I can't remember if I've seen this before. Um, Plaston RP3000. Let's put a space in there. To help the computer work that out. Right, okay, anyway. Um, what is this? It's. Uh, I might have looked at this. I think I did. Oh, no. Uh, okay, so that's a fairly small bit of kit there. Um, it's obviously going to hurt losing that, but it's not, uh, I, I doubt it's the end of the world, world. It's not exactly like a large radar vehicle as part of a battery. It's a small and light tactical direction finding system designed for direction finding of communication systems, automatic and fast radio monitoring, processing of interception data and registration in the reception area. It exchanges data in real time to coordinate information on the location of radio emission sources and the characteristics and create a map of the ra electronic radio situation. So I wonder whether you can try and find out where the piloting of, of drones is coming from um, using something like that. Anyway, uh, lost one of those, but generally that it's not huge. Compare that to, I don't know, a tank or something. Uh, it's gonna be quite a difference in, pr in cost there. Okay, uh, our single piece of artillery, couple of tanks, a single infantry fighting vehicle. Um, half a dozen APCs, mainly uh, no, all Western, and half a dozen mine resistant and British protection vehicles. Interestingly, there are two Mastiffs and one Bushmaster in the list there, uh, abandoned and destroyed. Those are Mastiffs are British provided uh, MRAPs, and the Bushmaster is an Australian provided MRAP. Don't get confused with the Bushmaster vehicle and the Bushmaster uh, machine gun heavy, like 
auto cannon, chain gun, whatever type thing. That's me smashing terms together there. But that's what you see on top of the Bradley, uh, often the Bushmaster gun, but the Bushmaster vehicle is an Australian one. Okay, then we have a couple of uh, trucks and civilian vehicles and, and, and whatnot. Okay, going up to the Russian losses, we have an air defense system damage, which is a 9K33 M3 OSA. Uh, that is going to hurt a little bit. And an electronic warfare system, a Groza 04M has been damaged. Uh, Groza 04M. And uh, no, it's not going to be that. That's a machine gun. Uh, that's an assault rifle, sorry. Uh, yeah, not sure. Anti-drone complex. Okay, so it, yeah, uh, that's anti-first-person view drone complex there. That's what's been destroyed. So that's not a very big bit of, bit of kit either, um, just to, to just to let you know. Okay, artillery, they have lost a number of D-30s and a D-74. Goodness me, it's uh, research day today, isn't it? D-74. Uh, this is... Uh, a very old gun. So we've heard of the M46 being used. This is even older. Yes, it is slightly older, although the production date started later than the M46. The M46 was designed from 1946 to 1950, and it started going into production, I think, in 1951. The uh, D74 uh, developed in the late 40s, so 1944 onwards, so it had slightly earlier production uh, time and a slightly later, uh, sorry, slightly earlier design time, slightly later production time. But basically around that kind of time, still, my goodness, they are getting out the oldies, uh, aren't they? So, uh, and then otherwise D30s, which are really old um, guns as well. Right, we have a lot of FPV drones being used here, but look at the artillery. Almost all of them taken out by vampire drones. So those will probably be nocturnal, nighttime strikes using those octocopters or hexacopters larger vampire drones uh, tanks we have quite a few tanks uh, seven tanks there uh, pretty good ratio of damage to destroyed and abandoned for the russians here uh, more damage than destroyed in in both the tank and the ifv categories um, range of tanks and quite a lot of infantry fighting vehicles even though most of them are actually damaged and then we have a few APCs to throw in there as well. There's a truck that's been captured. Uh, we are seeing lots more captured equipment at the moment than, uh, than we have done previously. And I think that's because finally in this war, there's a bit of maneuver warfare going on up in Kursk still. Okay, so that is from two days ago. Uh, or no, Sorry, three days ago. So then from two days ago, we have this list, which is showing us a, a higher rate of Ukrainian losses and Russian losses just. However most of that is civilian vehicles so suvs and trucks uh, um, or, or civilian origin vehicles when it comes to combat asset losses actually the russians losing about two and a half times maybe three to three to one times what the ukrainians have lost or did lose on that day so i think that's the significant stat you want there okay let's go and look at the ukrainian losses and see if there's anything significant to uh, C. Um, okay, we have um, a couple of engineering vehicles. We've got a boat, a couple of bits of artillery damage, M777, another howitzer, a couple of tanks. Um, we've got three infantry fighting vehicles. Unfortunately, one destroyed CV9040. Uh, that's the best infantry fighting vehicle they have, or arguably in the world. Uh, and then we have APCs. We've got five of those. Uh, usual Western M113s, Humvees, Strikers. Uh, and a couple of MRAPs, one captured, a QRP, that's a, uh, translates as the Hedgehog, that's a, a Turkish MRAP, Mine Resistant Ambush Protection Vehicle, and an, a Max Pro US provided one there. So mainly Western kits uh, in the combat asset losses, uh, apart from a, a BMP-1 and BTR, uh, uh, and a tank, a, a Soviet, it looks there. So that's, uh, that's okay for, for the Ukrainians, I guess, given what they're doing up and down the front lines. Uh, not huge losses, CV-90 is unfortunate there. So for the Russian losses, we have an engineering vehicle. We have two, two S7 Pions that have been lost and a BM-21 Grad. So the Grad's a multiple launch rocket system. And then the Pions are these huge... In fact, I showed you the video of both of those um, being hit by a Vampire drone, actually. So I showed you that two days ago, was it? Um, so that's that's on this list. Uh, so that would, that would track, actually, because this list is from two days ago. 
um, uh, and then a, a D20, D30. So some pretty old kit, but also um, e e two SMs are fairly old, but they are just humongous, uh, old, uh, humongous self-propelled artillery pieces. So PN, uh, Pion 2 S7, sorry. Uh, let's have a look at the images of this. They've got massive old barrels that go extend way beyond the length of the vehicle. So the, the, as you can see, they're huge um, bits of kit there, and they have quite a substantial range, I think, uh, as far as I can remember. So let's have a look at, um, yeah, it doesn't say there, does it? Uh, effective firing range, so 37.5 kilometers uh, or to, that's the effective firing range, maximum 47.5 kilometers. Uh, and that is, that's assisted. But compared to say, the other self-propelled howitzers that they're using, these these far out outstrip the range of those so it's useful to see those taken out we have a captured t90s which i showed you yesterday on a video uh that's good that's a zero sum game approach which is it's not just about the russians losing a piece it's about the ukrainians gaining one so it's worth two if you like same goes the other way of course and then a lot of these tanks are track garden sheds what does that tell you really good interception sorry really good destroyed and abandoned and captured to Damaged ratio here, 100% uh, are irretrievable losses here in the tank section. And there's about what, over 10 tanks there taken out. As I say, a lot of track garden sheds, and that tells you something, I think. Uh, and then we have infantry fighting vehicles. The vast, uh, vast majority of these are abandoned or destroyed. Uh, usual BMP 2s, 3s, BTRs, uh, BTI 82s. And we have uh, a handful of APCs as well. 100% of those are destroyed or abandoned. Then trucks, ATVs, and civilian vehicles thrown in as well. So I think much, well, a somewhat better day for the Ukrainians there in terms of the combat asset losses, although the Ukrainians lost a lot more uh, civilian vehicles, and that could be because there was a video that was dropped, a montage video or two that was dropped that, that led to all of those being added on the same day. It's probably not that that particular day was just horrendous for these sort of vehicles being taken out okay uh, moving on to what has taken place in the kursk region so the update on the combat asset losses there now if you remember at the beginning of the kursk attack you had ukrainians losing overwhelmingly more than the russians but never as much as the russians lost in their attacks in other places like for example Pokrovsk, which had a ratio has a ratio pretty much of five to one still uh, and then elsewhere on the front line varying, but the Russians losing considerably more than the Ukrainians when they are on the attack. Then the Ukrainians went on the attack and it was actually not too bad. I think at the most it was two to one, um, but but that is generally under two to one. And then it switched to Russians losing more than Ukrainians. So here almost double the losses. Uh, the total, so it, 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 since the last update, although the total is still Ukrainians losing more than Russians here, but it's almost one to one. So 287 Ukrainian losses to 249 Russian losses. But the recent additions is 36 Ukrainian, 68 Russian. Okay, and uh, here you get the whole range of the stuff that was lost, the, the, each of these added. Um, and for the Russians, we have a number of tanks, uh, but mainly infantry fighting vehicles it is is what we, what we see there added. And for the Ukrainians, there's only one tank, and actually most of these are infantry mobility vehicles. I won't say infantry fighting vehicles. Most of these be MRAPs and APCs actually. Uh, and it's only until you get up to uh, Captain Bradley there uh, and a few others that that you could call infantry fighting vehicles. Um, but anyway, yeah, th th those appear to be in the Kursk area, the most common sorts of vehicles that you see being lost. If we look here on, on the actual spreadsheet, um, infantry mobility p vehicles are separated from armored fighting vehicles, which is a self set, not, di you know, is different from tanks. So there you've got infantry mobility vehicles ha being a much larger category uh, than these other, uh, other ones. Uh, and interestingly for the Russians though, they use more fighting vehicles than infantry mobility vehicles. So what that means is the Russians will use uh, these uh, BMPs and, and whatnot much more than they use. Like the Ukrainians have a lot more MRAPs and a lot more 
So if we go to the loss list, we can maybe get a sense of this. Um, the Russians here, so this is a Russian list. Uh, you've got a lot of infantry fighting vehicles and four APCs. If you go down to the Ukrainian list, they've got three infantry fighting vehicles and five APCs and two MRAPs. In other words, the, the mix of what the Ukrainians are using is much more about getting troops made to be and not doing the fighting. Whereas the Russians, it's interestingly, it probably is about getting the troops made to be, but they're running low on MTLBs and they use BMPs and they can also do a bit of fighting. But they also use tanks. So this this stats tell us stories, right? So then when you have six garden track garden sheds in, and we know that with those, you can't move the turret. They're used as glorified APCs. Then these are effectively should be down in the orange category, technically. Uh, and this one as well, arguably. These are not being used as fighting vehicles. They're being used as transportation vehicles. Um, and I, I would argue that possibly these BMPs are really being used as transportation vehicles. Uh, and it, it, it probably goes to show that they just have fewer APCs and MRAPs it, just in general. Um, if we look at the day before, uh, we can see that the tanks and uh, for, the, for the Russians, this is tanks and infantry fighting vehicles take up the large majority there. There's still a track garden shed thrown in there. And then the APCs, there's only four APCs, no MRAPs. Ukrainians, they have, they've lost fewer vehicles than the Russians here. It's almost three to one. And yet the Ukrainians have three, they have six APCs and six MRAPs. So that's 12 infantry mobility vehicles and one infantry fighting vehicle. And it's completely flipped for the Russians. So I think that's that. That's an interesting observation to make there. And it's borne out by the losses in Kursk. And the question is, okay, what explains that? Do they just have more of these? Are they, you know, et cetera, et cetera, are they running out of the APCs? I don't think they had particularly many MRAPs compared to Western forces. I think Western forces use a lot more MRAPs than the Russians do. Um, and they rely on their older uh, sort of infantry fighting vehicle fleet. Um, anyway. Uh, but of course, they, they're probably going to be older and more susceptible to mines and, and IEDs on the sides of roads and things like that. OK, Tim White is sharing a video here of a Russian military channel, TV channel, publishing this, this video of alleged POWs uh, said to have been captured yesterday while trying to break through in the border in the Bryansk region. So another attack across the border. We've seen one in the Belgorod region, just near the Kharkiv uh, sector, Lipsy sector, the Ukrainians are breaking across there. We have seen them break across into Kursk in a number of places, obviously. And then further along, you've got Bryansk, where there are claims that they could be attacking there as well. Now, here, they've said to have been captured, trying to do a breakthrough into the border region. This time, two flags of Canada laid out supposedly the soldiers' belongings, one with an SS sign. Of course, every time they capture uh, Ukrainians, they have to throw in some kind of SS symbology. What worries me about this are the number of um, ATGMs, anti-tank uh, weaponry there. There is quite a lot of weaponry that has been captured. I presume this is genuine. If someone could tell me what they are, that would be good because that's a good dozen bits of kit. Um, I don't know whether this is a kind of bit of psyops, a bit of PR, or whether they generally captured all of that, but it would be slightly worrying to have... They, they appear to have more... ATGMs and than assault rifles, so that's kind of, kind of odd. Right, this is Turetsk. Now, Turetsk is interesting because the Ukrainians are counterattacking there, and they've actually taken some more land back again, um, although they're struggling in so many other places along the front line. But Turetsk is a, is, is a place where they're, they're having some success at the moment. Now, the, they controlled Turetsk, obviously. The Russians took over, and I wonder if the, the Ukrainians have basically rigged a load of explosives and buildings to wait until the russians get in and then do this so this is a remote controlled detonation according to sarin where you've got a building there and then it collapses it explodes and collapses i don't know if this side gets done as well but the claim is that there were russians inside so you know you rig the building wait till the russians go in you get 20 soldiers in there or whatever uh, and then you blow it up and it falls down and that's the end of those soldiers but that, that's a significant um explosion there some pretty horrible footage coming out of Turetsk. It is like many of these so-called liberated Ukrainian towns. It has been rubbleized. Um, it's, it's horrible. Right, moving on to distant strikes. So uh, what happened last night? Another fairly sizable attack. I say fairly sizable. 48 seems like 
a small attack these days, but of course that is a lot of Shahed drones coming across the border. 48 were sent in, 26 were intercepted, shot down, 20 stopped due to electronic warfare, so that's 46. One was returned to sender, so that's one hit possibly out of 48. So that's pretty good for the Ukrainians there, a good night at the office in terms of interception. Problem is, what goes up must come down, and I think Kiev saw some drones fall and so on and so forth. But there were missiles as well. No details of the missile from Tim there, and I haven't seen numbers of missiles from other people. But there were attacks on Kharkiv and Krivi Rear, uh, dead and wounded, in the Oznovyansky district of Kharkiv. A Grom E1 missile hit, so that's interesting. That's a, um, a fairly recent um russian missile i i have a feeling don't hear them being you uh, talked about much as a kh38 as grom e uh so grom e1 i'll have to look into it. i remember um looking into the grom e1 uh some time back um yeah it's used it for the first time um there you go uh russian aerospace forces Good. This was quite recent. Um, use a Grom E uh, Grom E one for the first time in Ukraine. Second of September twenty twenty four. Announced by the mayor of Kharkiv, a strike was carried out on August the thirty first on the city of Kharkiv using a hybrid between a missile and a glide bomb. The KH thirty six E Grom E one does not have any known characteristics to date, nor is there any real certainty about its mass use. The only record record of previous use was in March twenty twenty three. That's when I reported it. It wasn't set out. I just thought that's too soon. March 2023, when an unexploded missile, the E-2 version, uh, differently powered, was found in the Ukrainian field. That's that's what I had previously uh, reported. Anyway, there you go. So some kind of mixture between a, a missile and a guided glide bomb. Um, anyway, that's been used in Kharkiv. One house was completely destroyed. Another 19 buildings and four cars were damaged. Rescuers pulled the bodies of two women and two men from under the rubble. As a result, the ballistic missile attack on Krivirya uh, houses, outbuildings, and a hospital and cars were damaged. One person died. The number of injured reached 12. So some pretty horrific footage coming out. Now, this building in Kharkiv, unfortunately, is a really historic building, this one. Uh, I think it was, was it 1938 That was uh, or 1928 uh, to do with early administration. And uh, I don't know if I've got something on that. Anyway, Russia continued. Not anyway. I mean, it's serious. The, like, the history is being deleted of these these of Ukraine, basically, um, with every week that passes in this war. Russia continues shelling Ukrainian cities, a strike in Krivi Rear damaged a three-story resi uh, residential building, injuring at least 10 people, reports of regional administration. The attack sparked fires in a building and nearby structures, a medical facility and gas pipeline were also damaged. Um, number of wounded in Krivi Rear has uh, risen to 14, and there's the usual kind of pictures that, that come out um it's just horrific destruction um uh, because because russia yeah this is a building so russian glide bomb severely damaged the iconic building of Dezhprom, the symbol of kharkiv and one of europe's first skyscrapers that housed the ukrainian government after it was completed in 1928 Dezhprom survived the nazis but not putin hmm uh, two people have been injured in Kiev during an ongoing drone attack. Uh, so affected private areas were affected. Debris has caused a fire in, in another district as well. So these are as a result of drones that, you know, what goes up must come down. And when you are flying over the capital city of Ukraine, it's going to come down and blow up stuff, catch things on fire because, because it's a, you know, it's a capital city. Um, so, yeah, six injuries now recorded from falling debris in Kiev. Traces of blood, broken windows, dust and debris here in the Solomyansky district of the capital. Um, lots of videos of the damage there. Now, in terms of what Ukraine have done to Russia, an unprecedented strike. Now, actually, I don't know if this is Ukraine uh, or whether this, this is a case of people inside Chechnya doing this. Unprecedented, says Dmitry from War Translated. Uh, this morning around 6.30 a.m. local time, the so-called Russian Special Forces University, named after Vladimir Putin, in Gudermez, Chechnya, was attacked by unidentified drones, as reported by Ramzan Kadyrov. According to him, the roof of an empty building caught fire, but this is debatable. As seen in the photo, the fire was quite extensive. So I don't know that that looks like 
it's like a fairly new building. Uh, I doubt that's going to be a big old empty building there. Uh, so that is quite a significant uh, outcome strike, especially since it's every chance of not coming from Ukraine. I mean, it's going to be fairly long distance to get to Chechnya, but it could could be that the uh, Ukrainians have done that. Photos of the far Russian Special Forces University in Chechnya after a drone attack have been posted online. Um, what else? There is a re there was a really sizable explosion in Luhansk, and it looks like a an ammo depot or weapon store uh, was taken out there. And some are saying it was a scalp or storm shadow strike. I don't know. Don't know at all. Um, occupiers seeing some valuable things go up in smoke, possibly ammo or weapons. Some secondary explosions can be heard. Uh, Russia claims their air defence worked. Uh, but clearly not. So that's possibly a really good strike there. They've had some great success with hitting ammo uh, depots previously, and that, I think, has had some effect on the ability for the Russians to use uh, their artillery effectively. And in other words, they can't at the moment. I think they are they are struggling with, uh, with stockpiles. So location of the explosion there, given in Luhansk, occupied Luhansk, um, for those who want to know. Okay, moving on to other bits and pieces. We're going to start with uh, the Kremlin postpones the Kursk liberation deadline, which we heard previously, as the Ukrainian elite brigades destroy Russian assault force and advance using Western-provided Bradley vehicles and Abrams tanks. There's quite a lot of footage coming out of Kursk uh, of the Ukrainians doing a pretty good job with their Western-provided equipment, including some of these more attack-orientated vehicles like the Bradley and the the abrams so using tanks and rfps i was hearing in fact we're going to go through this in military aid that the ukrainians would prefer infantry fighting vehicles to tanks really they, they are more useful i said that previously the stuff that you can do with a tow missile on top of a bradley and its machine gun is auto cannon you can go and absolutely rinse these places and carry a bunch of troops it's just such a versatile vehicle the bradley and i, I have a feeling you know that they they prefer that to being given a bunch of main battle tanks that that are that you know have their advantages obviously you know big old shell going a longer distance maybe or well, the tow missiles uh, but they they have more shells but then you know you you can't really carry lots of people in them and they're pretty heavy they're not as maneuverable etc etc um okay so Kursk could be good for the Ukrainians in one particular region of the west the northwest of the Kursk salient. Uh, here we have Grace Gull saying, pro-Ukrainian channel report, Ukrainian reclaims ground near Olgovka in Kursk, so that's near Koronevo, uh, that kind of area. So that's good news, but that kind of pales into insignificance compared to what the Ukrainians are losing down near Vukhodar. They've taken that Bohoy, Bohoyovlenka, um, just north of Vukhodar, and it's not looking good there. And indeed, uh, Euromad and Press reporting that Russia is intensifying their attacks near Liman, so that's north of the Serebryansky Forest in Donetsk Oblast, using coercive tactics against its own troops. According to HUR, Russia deployed additional assault units in a push to control this strategic location. So they're having quite a lot of success in the Makivka Nevska region and coming further down towards T Turny and then Torska. Uh, and that, that is a bit of a challenge for the Ukrainians there. Um, and as well, further up in Pischani, so. It's all very challenging for the Ukrainians. Ukraine is bracing for assaults involving North Korean soldiers who arrived last week in Russia's western Kursk region, according to New York Times. Now, there are lots of these claims about the North Koreans. So some are saying, so here we've got George Barros actually on the BBC News here, saying North Korean troops sent to Russia's Kursk region on the front line with Ukraine, in, with Ukraine are thought to be from the Army's 11th Corps, North Korean Special Forces. So we'd heard that these were elite forces, then we heard that they categorically weren't elite forces. And now we're hearing from George Barrows that they are elite forces. I'm not sure. I don't know at all. There are also claims that they are... I don't know if I've got that here. Yes, yes, this one. So Kiev Independent. North Korean troops possibly heading to the front lines. There's a language barrier, though, that's causing problems, says South Korea. The assessment comes shortly after NATO Secretary Mark Rutter... Secretary General Mark Rutter confirmed that North Korea had sent troops to Russia, so there could be a language barrier. Uh, that's been mentioned a number of times, um, but, you know, still sort of 
three to 12,000 troops joining the fray there. Now, interesting that the US has said this. However, the devil's in the detail. And the detail is revolving around the word, a single word. And the word is new. And this is what everyone's reporting. And I'm not really quite sure. We may get clarity today. This could be really good news. And this is exactly what the US should be doing, by the way. And they should have done this ages ago. To put, I, I've said to you, you've heard me say it a hundred times. We should be providing red lines for Russia. If you do this, then we will do this. And that should stop Russia from crossing red lines. Instead, we imagine red lines that Russia have in their heads. They've never actually said these things. We imagine these red lines that we can't allow Ukraine to fire deep into Russian territory. So we create our own Russian red lines and then we then we dare not step over them. It's a ridiculous way of, of doing this war. We should be throwing these red lines in Russia's face and we should be wrapping Russia up with red lines, tangling them up in a web of red lines. So if you do this, this will happen. If you do that, this will happen. If you do this, that will happen, right? We told you. And it therefore, any any kind of escalation, scare quotes, escalation from us is because they have done something that they knew the consequences would be whatever it is, right? So the escalation is on them rather than inventing their red lines and we, we fear escalation. So anyway, back to what the Pentagon has announced, there will be no more new restrictions on the use of American weapons for Ukraine if the North Koreans join the war. Now, let's ignore the new. This idea of like, if the North Koreans join, then, th and this is what um, Mertz said with regard to strike. So the um, leader of the opposition, Germany, said with regard to striking civilian targets. So say, say for example, Kharkiv being struck last night. If you can continue to do that, we will give you Tauruses. That's what he proposes. Great idea. Russia would hopefully then stop bombing Kharkiv. You keep bombing these civilian cities, these this civilian infrastructure, or we will provide Tauruses and allow them to strike deep into Russia. Here, if you allow North Koreans to fight against the Ukrainians, we will there will be no more restrictions, so you can fire deep into Russia. The problem is the word new. What does new here mean? Like, we won't put other restrictions on what what are you talking about you're you're now bringing into a conversation new restrictions that wasn't even a thing so i don't know if there's something lost in translation here really need some clarity on that but the idea of presenting russia with the red lines is definitely good okay russia said uh not russia as a country hasn't said this uh the belgrade regional governor has announced that the one-time payment for signing a contract would be reduced to eight hundred thousand rubles from the january the first Budget cuts, or did they find that soldiers from North Korea are just more affordable? It's really interesting. So, are they running out of money and they can't afford these signing on contracts? Well, they can't actually. They are running out of money uh, regionally. There is all sorts of money being thrown at the war from a regional point of view. But also, there might be less need to attract U uh, Russian soldiers because they're getting North Koreans for free. Or, you know some kind of quid pro quo but it's not costing regional military administrations to to get these troops in so interesting there okay a little insight into how russia's going i talked the other day about the price of butter having gone up significantly they've now started putting butter in many stores in those anti-theft packs so you have to get them unlocked you know a bit like the the things that set off alarms on the top of like expensive um alcohol bottles or whatever that's now going on butter. Russian telegram channels report the the situation here where two men robbed a supermarket in Moscow of 25 packs of butter. An employer tried to stop them. They pulled out a knife. Police have already detained them. Um, and a criminal case was opened. They faced 10 years in prison for butter. Uh, Russian media report that butter went up in price this year. Stores are starting to put security tags on butter like they used to do with expensive alcohol and other luxury items. So he says, I didn't need to tell you that. He's, he said that. So there you go. I, I think that's just a little bit of an insight into how it's going in Russia. Now, Google. It's funny, interesting when people grab the old, the old Google uh, font there. Of course, it hasn't been like that for, what, a decade? Anyway. Russian media reported that a Russian court has fined Google two undecillion rubles. 
Now, undecillion, it's either a real number or it just signifies that they're undecided how much it really is. Is there 37 zeros or 42? Oof, don't know. Just I, I'm undecided. I'm also undecided whether we're actually going to pay it because, you know, we just put on a stupid number onto Google and we're expecting them them to pay that. Really? Really? They're going to do that? So anyway, an, uh, two undecillion rubles is what Google should be uh, paying the Russians, as according to the Russians. This fine was imposed on Google because the company failed to comply with the requirements to restore the accounts of 17 Russian YouTube channels, including Channel 1, uh, Russia 1, and others, as well as the YouTube channel of Margarita Simonian. This amount doubles every Sunday. An undecillion is a unit with 36 zeros. And two undecillion rubles is equivalent to 20 decillion dollars. Uh, this is a lot of money, and that's ridiculous. Russia is ridiculous? Question mark. Discuss. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate your support. I'll speak to you soon. Oh, no, and just before you go, Daniel Smith from... from uh, from Bristol with love has sent us uh, photos of arriving first of all in Slovakia and then getting to um, to okay uh, they there you go uh, and we spoke to uh, some of these guys the other day on the live stream getting to Romania to yeah. deliver all of this equipment hey they're the guys Johnny and Daniel, everyone there, um, all offloading to uh, to people who are going to take yeah, that. It's not photogenic at all. As for Dan, well, what can we By say? The way, TP politics. Hey! I don't know what that means. <laughs> come out look at that. He's even got sunlight coming in over the van to make it look happier. Think of this, God is smiling down on us. That's what the sunlight means. <laughs> so there you go. They, uh, from Bristol with love, have, have got all the way to uh, to their destination and they're handing over this uh, stuff that the uh, Ukrainians have, have requested and they've uh, fundraised in, in the hometown of Bristol and uh, we've we've helped out hopefully a little bit there um, when they've appeared. They've been on the channel twice now, interviewed both of them. So that's really awesome. Well done, guys. Congratulations. You're doing such a fabulous job there. Okay. Well, I don't know what that is. Um, right. And the last bit of awesome good news is this. And I am genuinely, genuinely bowled over by you guys. We have gone over the uh the objective for our fundraising campaign for nafo and we have fundraised for two trucks and in fact we're 1100 over there someone has just very kindly donated through me another 500 pounds to add to this so we'll be able to afford a mavix 3 i think uh, drone as well Actually, I'm just looking. So Peter Klukan, amazing £500 donation. And Solitech as well, £50 donation to me. I'll need to go and check that. Uh, so I'll be putting that towards towards um, a drone that should, should cover another drone or a drone as well on top of this. So you guys have been absolutely freaking amazing. I'm going to do a, uh, a video that I promised you yesterday, like pushing, going for the final push. And I didn't even need to do that because you guys have done this it is just mind-blowing pretty much nine days and we raised two trucks worth absolutely phenomenal you guys should be so proud of yourselves thank you to all of you incredibly generous people but i will do a video uh, thanking you more formally for that anyway take care guys and i'll speak to you soon